In the comments, the question is often asked, why don't negatively charged electrons of an atom fall onto the positively charged atomic nucleus? And recently, it occurred to me that with just this question, you can effectively illustrate a whole series of important principles of quantum physics. In fact, the early history of modern physics largely boils down to the search for an answer to the question of why the electron doesn't fall onto the atomic nucleus. And it turned out that it was impossible to answer this question within the framework of classical physics. So scientists had to essentially create a new branch of physics known as quantum mechanics. And in our video today, we will try to follow in the footsteps of the physicists of the early 20th century through the chain of reasoning that led them and us along with them to where it led. This story begins in 1897 when the English physicist Joseph Thomson discovered the tiniest charged particle, the electron, and later proved that electrons are a component of atoms, that is, the smallest chemically indivisible particles of matter. Since atoms themselves are neutral, that is, they have a zero net electrical charge, it was obvious that the negatively charged electrons in the atom must coexist with some carriers of positive charge that balance them out. Thomson himself proposed the so-called plum pudding model, or, as it is also called, the raisin bun model, in which the negatively charged raisin-like electrons are embedded in a loose, positively charged bun. To test this model, Ernest Rutherford conceived and Hans Geiger and Ernst Marsden carried out a series of experiments, essentially boiling down to the following. Thin sheets of gold foil were bombarded with alpha particles produced by the decay of radon-222 and radium-226. The alpha particle essentially represents the nucleus of a helium-4 atom with two protons and two neutrons, although this was not yet known at the time. It was known only that alpha particles, firstly, have a positive charge, and secondly, their mass and consequently size should be much smaller than that of gold atoms of which the foil target consisted. According to the plum pudding model, rapidly flying alpha particles should practically not be deflected by the loose pudding substance and pass through it almost without deviations, except for a slight deceleration when passing through the dough. The largest deviations were supposed to be observed in cases when alpha particles pass as if tangentially to gold atoms. And even in this case, according to calculations, the magnitude of the deviation should be only fractions of a degree. That is, if Thomson's model were correct, we should have observed a relatively small widening of the initial beam and probably some slowing down of the particles. However, in practice, something different was observed the vast majority of alpha particles passed through the foil completely without scattering, as if through empty space. But some of them were reflected, including at very large angles, up to an angle of 180 degrees, as if undergoing elastic collisions with some massive compact objects. From this, it was concluded that the atomic nucleus is actually a compact, massive, and of course, positively charged object, occupying a negligible part of the entire space inside the atom. And around this nucleus, at a distance tens of thousands of times larger than its dimensions, are small and lightweight negatively charged electrons. It is precisely the distance from the electrons to the nucleus, or rather, the sizes of the corresponding region occupied by the electrons that we perceive as the sizes of the atom, which determine its chemical and physical properties. After all, negatively charged electrons should be attracted to the positively charged nucleus and eventually fall onto it. That is, the observed size of the atom should be of the order of the size of the nucleus. However, the fact that real atoms have significantly larger sizes indicated that electrons for some reason do not fall onto the nucleus. And in order to explain this, physicists had to understand why they don't do it. That is, for the first time, the very question that we have set ourselves today arose. A fairly logical answer to it was given by Rutherford himself. Namely, electrons do not fall onto the nucleus because they revolve around it in circular orbits. Indeed, in one of our previous videos, we mentioned that the motion of a particle under the action of a constant force, always perpendicular to the direction of its velocity, will have the character of endless rotation Attracting bodies will as if constantly fall towards the center of attraction, in our case, the atomic nucleus. 
but always miss it. A similar process is observed in celestial mechanics when our Earth and other planets revolve around the sun, attracting it, but never falling onto it completely, or when the moon or artificial satellites like the ISS revolve around our Earth. And it was beautiful and logical and very much resembled what we observe in everyday life. But quite soon, physicists realized that this couldn't work. The thing is, electrons are charged particles. And according to the equations of electrodynamics, any charged particle moving with acceleration must emit electromagnetic radiation. About why and how this happens, we have a separate video on our channel. Moreover, accelerated charged particles indeed emit electromagnetic radiation. This principle underlies, for example, radio transmitters in all their variety. So here's the thing. The rotational motion of the electron along its orbit is accelerated, and the rotating electron must continuously emit, thereby losing its energy, or more precisely, the kinetic energy of its rotational motion. In simpler terms, the speed of the electron's rotation must quickly decrease, causing the radius of its orbit to continuously decrease until the electron falls onto the nucleus. And this should happen fairly quickly, bringing us back to atoms with sizes comparable to the size of the atomic nucleus. Furthermore, atoms containing rotating electrons would constantly emit electromagnetic radiation with certain characteristics, which was not observed in nature. That is, Rutherford's model led to a picture that contradicted what we observe in nature. In other words, from mechanical considerations, electrons had to rotate around the nucleus to avoid falling onto it due to electrical attraction. But from electrodynamical considerations, they couldn't rotate around it at the same time because in that case, they would fall onto it due to energy loss through radiation. The question of why electrons don't fall onto the nucleus again arose before physicists in all its glory, but now for slightly more complex reasons. An answer to it was provided, well, or at least attempted to be provided, by Niels Bohr, a student of Rutherford. In 1913, he proposed that electrons in an atom could revolve not around just any orbits, but around orbits where their angular momentum, that is, the product of the electron's momentum by the orbit radius, equals an integer multiple of Planck's constant. According to Bohr, it was impossible for the electron to reside on an intermediate orbit between the allowed ones, and hence it became somewhat more or less clear that electrons indeed couldn't emit radiation due to rotation around the atom. This process would lead to a gradual decrease in the height of their orbits, during which they would have to occupy the impossible intermediate orbits. And according to Bohr's model, an electron could only emit radiation in the case of a discontinuous transition from one allowed orbit to another closer to the nucleus. Bohr's hypothesis seemed to answer the question of why electrons don't fall onto the nucleus. However, it explained very little overall. For example, it was completely unclear why only certain orbits of electrons were permissible in an atom. Because in orbital motion in celestial mechanics, these orbits can be anything. Moreover, it remained a mystery what physical mechanism prevents a rotating electron in an atom from emitting electromagnetic radiation. After all, outside the atom, accelerated and, in particular, rotating electrons emit radiation perfectly in accordance with the equations of electrodynamics. That is, it turned out that the same, or at least very similar processes under different conditions occur fundamentally differently, and this required at least an explanation. And Bohr didn't have such an explanation, which is why his model was subject to rather harsh criticism from contemporaries. However, it had one colossal advantage. It allowed quantitatively correct description of many parameters of the simplest atom, the hydrogen atom with one proton in the nucleus and one electron in its orbit. That is the main criterion for testing the correctness of the theory through comparison with experiment, Bohr's idea passed. It remained only to understand the fundamental reasons underlying Bohr's hypothesis, which turned out to be, I repeat, correct. That is, once again, to understand why electrons really don't fall onto the nucleus. Another fundamentally important step towards understanding was made 10 years later in 1923 by Louis de Broglie. By that time, physicists had already come to the concept of the corpuscular wave nature of light, to the fact that light in some situations, for example, when scattered on narrow slits or interfering, behaves like a wave, 
and in others, for example, when emitted or absorbed by a solid body, behaves like a particle, a photon. And this particle can be attributed such ordinary characteristics of particles as kinetic energy and momentum. In particular, the momentum of a photon turned out to be equal to such a quantity, where h is Planck's constant, and lambda is the wavelength of the corresponding electromagnetic radiation. So here's the thing. De Broglie suggested that not only a light wave can exhibit the properties of a photon particle, but real particles, such as an electron, can exhibit the properties of some wave. Moreover, the wavelength of this wave is related to its momentum in the same way as the wavelength of electromagnetic radiation is related to the momentum of a photon. Thus, de Broglie expanded the concept of the corpuscular wave duality of light, turning it into a concept of the corpuscular wave duality of everything in the world. Any wave is supposed to have some physical meaning, an explanation of what wave it is. In the case of electromagnetic waves, these are oscillations of the intensity of electric and magnetic fields propagating in space. For waves on the surface of water, these are oscillations of the water level itself. The oscillation that the de Broglie wave represents, de Broglie himself couldn't formulate. It was Max Born who did it for him in 1926, showing that the de Broglie wave is a wave of probability. More precisely, the probability density of finding a particle in a particular volume of space. That is, the movement of an electron in space can be considered as the propagation in this space of a wave of probability to detect the electron at a certain point. Now let's look at the movement of the de Broglie electron wave in an atom. As we know, in it the electron cannot move freely because it is bound to the nucleus by electric attraction. Physicists say that the electron is in a potential well from which it cannot escape unless it has enough energy and is forced, as was supposed in Bohr's model, to rotate around the nucleus in some orbit. In order for further reasoning to be clearer, I suggest considering an atom with an electron rotating around it as if it were on edge. From this point of view, the movement of the electron looks like oscillations. First, it moves to the right, reaches the farthest right point, and then turns, starting to move to the left. Accordingly, the propagation of the de Broglie wave of this electron in the atom should somehow look like this as well. And this is already somewhat similar to what we observe in classical physics. The wave goes from one end of a certain space, reaches the other end, and returns. We observe such situations, for example, in oscillations of the density of an air column in certain closed spaces, oscillations of a string fixed at both ends, and we know what happens in such situations. A standing wave is formed, the different points of which oscillate with different amplitudes. In some points, known as nodes, the amplitude of oscillations should be zero. In others, known as antinodes, it will be maximum. Accordingly, in our case, it would be logical to assume that the de Broglie wave of the electron in the atom should also form a standing wave. And we can even understand what properties this wave will possess. We know for sure that outside the region limited by the orbit diameter, the probability of detecting our electron is zero because we are given that it is trapped in the potential well of the nucleus field. Accordingly, we conclude that at the boundary of the potential well, that is, at distances equal to plus and minus the radius of the orbit, the amplitude value of the wave should be zero. And this means that inside the electron's orbit in the atom, a whole number of de Broglie wavelengths should fit one wavelength, two wavelengths, three wavelengths, and so on. Mathematically, this statement will be written like this, where n is some integer, lambda is the wavelength of the de Broglie wave, and l is the length of the path that the de Broglie wave travels. Now, all we have to do is remember that the electron rotates in a circle, so l will be equal to the radius of the orbit multiplied by 2 pi, and then substitute into this formula the expression for the wavelength of the electron's de Broglie wave. By transforming the obtained expression, we easily get the criterion introduced by Bohr, quantum orbits, but not as a given, but as a consequence of the fact that the electron caught in the potential well of the atom possesses wave properties. However, in order to explain Bohr's hypothesis of orbit quantization, we had to introduce another actually significantly more exotic hypothesis about the electron, that is, the particle, possessing wave properties. And now we have to somehow show that this is indeed the case. 
Fortunately, physicists studying the real world always have the opportunity to ask the universe whether a particular hypothesis is true by conducting an experiment. And in 1927, such an experiment was conducted by Clinton Davison and Lester Germer. They showed that a beam of electrons passing through a crystalline lattice is scattered on this lattice, similarly to how light is scattered on diffraction gratings, that is, as a wave, not as a particle, forming a characteristic pattern of alternating stripes known as a diffraction pattern. This confirmed the validity of de Broglie's hypothesis that the electron indeed possesses wave properties, no matter how crazy this idea may seem to us, who have grown up in the logic of the macroscopic world, where particles are particles and waves are waves, and there is very little in common between them. More precisely, in fact, not only electrons and not even only quantum particles possess wave properties. All material objects do, including objects of the material world. Even a tennis ball, in fact, does not fly as a single object, as we are used to thinking, but spreads out in space like a wave. However, since the momentum of a tennis ball is measured in units of kilograms per meters per second, and Planck's constant is a very small value of the order of 10 to the power of mega 34 joules per second, we conclude that the de Broglie wavelength for a tennis ball is about 10 to the power of mega 34 meters. This is undoubtedly an infinitesimally small value, trillions of times smaller than any value we can measure with our modern technology, and therefore we simply cannot detect wave properties in macroscopic objects. However, for quantum objects like electrons, for which momenta are of the order of 10 to the power of minus 20 to 10 to the power of minus 25, the wavelength becomes comparable to the characteristic sizes of the systems in which we study them that is, in this case, the sizes of atoms. And these effects, of course, must already be taken into account. In other words, there is no separate quantum physics. The familiar classical physics ultimately also obeys quantum laws. It's just that on the scales of lengths, speeds, and masses with which we deal in everyday life, most quantum mechanical effects turn out to be too insignificant to manifest themselves in any way and somehow participate in shaping our life experience and the logic based on this experience. That is precisely why quantum mechanics seems so strange and sometimes illogical to us. But we have digressed. And meanwhile, our main question, the question of why electrons do not fall onto the atomic nucleus, still has not received a definitive answer. Indeed, even if we have convinced ourselves that the condition of orbit quantization in the atom applies, we still may wonder what will happen if n in this formula equals zero. Indeed, this corresponds to a zero orbit radius, that is, the situation the electron has fallen onto the nucleus. Since we know that electrons still do not fall onto the nucleus, such a situation apparently is impossible. But why exactly? The answer to this question is provided by another fundamental principle of quantum mechanics. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, which prohibits simultaneously precisely measuring the position and momentum of a particle. More precisely, the uncertainty relation states that the product of the uncertainty in these parameters must be greater than or equal to half of the reduced Planck constant. With this in mind, let's again look at our atom and its electron. We do not know exactly where in the atom the electron will be at any given moment, but we do know that it is definitely at a distance from the nucleus, not exceeding the radius of its orbit. In other words, the inaccuracy in determining the position of the electron is equal to plus minus the orbit radius. The same goes for momentum. When the electron moves in the atom, it takes on values ranging from plus p when the electron flies, say, to the right to minus p when it flies to the left. That is, the momentum uncertainty, or delta p, equals p itself. And with this in mind, the uncertainty relation for the electron will be written like this. In other words, the product of the electron's orbit radius by its momentum cannot be less than half of the reduced Planck constant. And if we now also recall that this product, according to the criterion of Bohr proven by us, equals a whole number of Planck constants, then we automatically come to the conclusion that n in Bohr's criterion cannot be equal to zero, but must be at least one. That is, the electron must have a minimum orbit, 
below which it is forbidden to descend by the uncertainty principle. The state of the atom, in which electrons rotate precisely on such orbits, is called the ground state. Thus, we have excluded all possibilities for the electron to fall onto the nucleus. And at the same time, we have dealt with the principles of quantum mechanics that precisely prohibit it from doing so. Today, in quantum physics, however, they do not reason in categories like those we used above. The same uncertainty principle, for example, essentially prohibits us from asserting that the electron rotates around the nucleus in some circular orbit of a fixed radius. Instead, we say that the electron is somehow smeared out over the atom within a certain region, which we call the electron cloud, and fundamentally cannot say how exactly it moves inside this region or if it moves at all. The wave representation of de Broglie in modern quantum mechanics is also not used straightforwardly. The ideas of Bohr, Born, de Broglie, Pauli, and others have been reinterpreted and found their reflection in modern equations of quantum mechanics, such as the Schrodinger and Dirac equations. And in modern quantum mechanics, atoms are no longer depicted as circles. Instead, physicists solve the corresponding equations for the corresponding conditions. We cannot correctly and accurately draw quantum mechanical systems on paper or a computer screen, and even less so their evolution. But we can describe it using the universal language of mathematics. Of course, the thought that describing what is happening in the quantum world without mastering mathematics is impossible is a bit discouraging. But alas, the universe is not obliged to be such that we like it. And all we can do is try to find some analogies that would give an idea of what is happening in the quantum world and at the same time at least not too strongly contradict what is actually happening there. This is what we are doing on our channel and there are many exciting tasks ahead of us in this field. Well, for now, all the best and until we meet again.